Praise God. How many of you are excited today? Anybody? Yes? Why not? No. Okay, so I'll try it again. Anybody excited today? That's better. That's better. Praise the Lord. We should be excited. We should be always be excited because God is that good and he's that great. He really is. And so, you know, I hope over this period of time you've actually been praising more, that you've encouraged yourself to praise. It's not always something you want to do, but it's something you ought to do. And in particular, remember that praise is all about putting into your mouth what God has already said. That's basically what it is. People are like, well, so does that mean I have to know how to carry a tune? No. You just need to put in your mouth what God's already said. And when you put that in your mouth and you give it back to him, not only is it true, but it's powerful. And in that power, you actually will find some surprising things happen in your life, like your mood changes. Can you say amen to that? I was talking to Tara, and she was just relating just a, a situation she had this week. And she was like, normally I'm sitting and I'm listening to... When I get in my car, I'm listening to news and, you know, just hearing what's going on politically. And she said, but I drove somebody else's car and I, and, and I got in it and I started driving it and it was 93.3. And most of you should know that's the Christian station. And on, it wasn't that it was 93.3, but 93.3 purposes to play good Christian music. And it's uplifting. So she said, you know, my, my mood changed. My attitude changed just driving down the road with, in a car with praise music playing. Anybody say amen to that? And so, see, we know this is true. We're like, but I'm sad today. You know what I would say to you if you said this morning that you're sad or you're depressed or you're downtrodden? You know what I would say? Any guess? One is, what are you meditating on? What do you, you must be, you're in a funk because you're thinking about funky stuff. But then what else would I say to you? Uh-huh, that's exactly what I would say. So have you spent any time in praise today? Have you, have, you honored, have you offered up to God the beauty of who he is? Have you spent any time confessing how awesome God is? Because I can understand why you might be depressed and not have a way out, but the way out is to praise. Anybody say amen to that? When we're in a funk, many times the way out is to praise. When you're afraid, many times the way out is to praise God. And remember, what praising God is is putting what he has said is true into your own mouth. Can you say amen to that? That's what it is. It really is that. Now, you can do it to music, but sometimes my praise is simply saying God is good and I know he's going to take care of this thing and, and I have full faith in him because he's faithful. It's things like that. But you learn to put on your mouth what is going to be edifying to your life and actually edifying to others. How many of you like complainers in your life? Anybody? Some of us do. <laughs> we like complainers. Because sometimes we like to hear their complaint because it's worse than ours. It's like, well, at least they're, they're worse off than me. Anybody admit to that? At least they're worse off than me. Oh, did you hear Susie talking about how bad her life is? Well, at least I'm not that bad. And so, you know, but that's, that's codependence, right? That's not good. I'd rather be around people who always have a praise, somebody who always has an uplifting thought, somebody who always says, yeah, but God's bigger than this. The people that actually lift me up are the people that have a praise. Can you say amen? amen. And, and yeah, it may be, I didn't realize God was that way. Sometimes people praise and say, well, you know, I, I know I feel alone, but God's always with me. And at first you may say, well, how could that be true? They may be pointing out to you a truth that you're not familiar with. And you have to check yourself and say, well, wait a minute, you believe God's with you all the time? Where'd you get that from? And actually, it's a way to reach out. And actually, when you praise God, do you know people hear you? I guess you didn't. When you praise God, people hear you. And when they hear you, what do you think they're getting out of your praise? Anything? Oh, he's just a Christian. What do you think they're getting out of your praise? Hmm? I hope they're getting encouragement out of your praise. Truth, hopefully, right? You're saying something that they may not have known, but that's beautiful. What a beautiful thought. God made all of the beautiful flowers in the world, and so now when I go and see flowers, I think of God. Please say amen. Or as a pastor said, you know what he loves about dogs? They remind him of God. I'm not, in, I mean, you know I'm not into dogs, right? Everybody knows I'm not into dogs. Come on, say hallelujah. Pastor's not into dogs, but you know what? I'm watching this dog, and this dog is cool. He's like a little, I, I'm starting to see this dog tr trot through my house. 
follow me everywhere, put his butt on my arm. I can't lay down in the bed. I can't lay down in the bed because as soon as I lay down in the bed, he must smell me laying down in the bed because I hear him up the stairs, jumps on the bed. He has to jump on the bed. He can't just quietly get into the bed. He's got to bound into the bed, jump on me, lick me in the face, lick my hand because he wants, he knows that's how I rub him is when he licks me because I get tired of being wet all the time. So it's like, you know, let me towel off a little bit and rub the dog. But then he just, he just, he's just, that's the happiest place in his life is with his butt on my arm, laying there next to me in bed. Can anybody say amen? He, I'm starting to love him. Who could not love that? But then you say to yourself, who made that thing? Who made that? Why would God make that? Why would he program and, and make instinctive in a dog things like they guard over you? They watch your back. I sit in a room with him, and he comes, and he puts his butt on me. He has to put his butt on me somewhere. He puts his butt on my foot, and he stares toward the front door. And that's what he does. Do you know that little dog is starting to guard me? Somebody say man. Not only is he loving on me and licking on me constantly, but he's putting his butt on me for reassurance of his own. And then in being reassured, he's watching the door. And he's making sure nothing comes after me. I don't know about you, but I see God all over that. I see God all in the way dogs are designed. And they're designed to love. Do you know dogs are designed to have love from people? How many of you figured that out yet? Here's how I know. Here's him, right? He's got four legs. And I flip him over. And if you know, dogs really don't have access to this part of their chest. How many of you knew that? And so when you start going like this, he goes, this is my dog laying there, this little fluffy guy. And it's just like, <laughs> he's just like going crazy. He's in love with the fact that I can touch a place in him that he can't really get at. And when I scratch it, it's the most joyous thing he could feel. Somebody say amen. Do you know God can access places in your heart that you have no, you can't, even, you can't even scratch that itch? And then when he gets close to you, man, he starts doing this, and you're like, I don't know if your leg does that too, but this is the way you feel. My God is filling my needs. He's actually so intimate with me and so aware that I can't scratch that, that he's willing to rub and scratch and knead that thing so that I would feel comforted and at peace. Can anybody say amen? amen. You see, everything God made points back to who he is. And so for us to not honor God in that, we have to honor God in that. I have to say, well, I saw a little bit more of you, God, today and that little fluffy little black and white dog that gets on my nerves every so often. And his little butt, I'm hoping it's clean because it's always on me. I do. I'm just like, I hope he wiped his butt. Because his butt's on me and other parts of his anatomy. Somebody say amen. I mean, he's just leaning there. It's like, you must not feel like that's an issue because it's like it's all over me. Praise God. But God, again, uses those things to remind us of himself. How many of you know God is the most loving, tender, wonderful person you could ever know? How many of you would say amen to that? Amen. My God is loving. He's tender. He's warm. He's approachable. He approaches me. He wants to hang with me. Somebody say amen. Amen. God wants to hang with me. He wants to spend time with me. If, you, if we want to wonder about our hunger, you know where we get it from his image. And so we're hungry for what he's hungry for. We're hungry for relationship because our God is hungry for relationship. We're hungry for love because he's designed that way. And when we come to grips with that, we say he's perfect match for us. We're a perfect match for him because what better to better thing than two people that are hungry for relationship? And so I be, I'm a perfect match for my God. Can you say amen? And God is a perfect match for me. And everything else, you guys are imperfect, but he's perfect in my life. And so, but the more I get used to that intimacy, if you want to figure out how to become more intimate with other people, become intimate with God. Actually, predominate on intimacy with God. Say to yourself, I'm going to be intimate with him because he's safe. How many of you know he's safe? God is safe. We're not. And so when we get closer to God, that's a safe place to be. Can you say amen? And people are like, well, you know, I left the church because people hurt me. Yeah, people are going to do that to you. 
But don't leave God because people hurt you. Because God's the perfect one that's actually going to help heal that thing, and you'll go back to them at some point. You'll forgive them, and you'll figure out that their failures are just like yours. And you're both, you know, both sides of that thing doesn't work, but with God it always works. But this is why we have to learn to speak positively about our God and to let that come out of our mouths, and that's actually part of the discipline that God's established. How many of you know God gives us disciplines to follow? Can you say amen to that? I know we get a lot of preaching about, no, it's not, we're not under the law anymore. But that doesn't mean there aren't good things for, to do. Just, you're not. You're, you know, and the brother was showing me his freedom scriptures. Absolutely. We are free to choose. But scripture also says that, that there are certain things that are beneficial to us that we should do. How many of you agree with that? There are certain things that are just beneficial to you. So you don't have to do it. You don't have to praise God, but you should. You don't have to lift up a praise to him and understand the word of God, but you should because it's a benefit to you. It's not because it's going to make me impressed because I'm, I shouldn't have the time to worry about you. I should be more focused on myself. But you know what? There are some disciplines that you should do. Everybody okay with that? There are things you should do. One of them is praise God and learn how to praise. And actually, my challenge to you even on Sunday would be don't just let those songs swing by you. Don't feel like you've got to carry the note, but some of those words are powerful for you to be able to say. Can you say amen to that? Amen. Yes, I will surrender to the Lord. My God is my shield. I mean, if you, and that's why praise can be so powerful, because they put into a musical context what is spiritual truth. And the closer they are to that, the more powerful the praise will be for you. Can you say amen to that? And yes, it is the praise and worship team's responsibility to understand we're not just singing A, B, C, 1, 2, 3, right? We're not doing that. We're actually putting the Word of God into the context of music so that people can confess it. Would you agree with me, Brennan? That's what we're doing. It becomes more powerful when we infuse it with the truth and the Word of God, and that's what people sing. And so, yes, it's important what you sing. Anybody that listens to current music knows that's true. It's important what you sing and what you say because that's what you hear and that's where faith is built up and out of the abundance of your mouth, right? Out of the abundance of your heart, your mouth will speak and you'll, it'll, it'll come back. And so there's times when, yeah, I'm listening to Lauren Daigle and it's just like, my God, I'm just singing the two, I'm singing the words because I'm not, I can't possibly be musically like her. But what I can do is say those same things. That you give me everything that I need. How many of you believe that about God? And that's one of her songs. It's just, and you give, yeah, I, you give me everything, everything, everything that I need. And sometimes you need to confess that. And that's how you praise God. Everybody with me on that? That's how you do it. You put God's words in your mouth. But power, the praise has the power to change things in the spirit. It's clear because the examples I would give you are Jericho, right? The walls came down not because they fought the battle, not because they were spiritually so powerful, you know, that they knocked the walls down. No, God knocked the walls down. What he told them to do was walk around those walls quietly seven times and on the seventh time begin to shout. What he was demonstrating is that when you face a spiritual barrier like that, the best thing you can do is have faith and praise God. Can you say amen to that? You see, you're trying to knock your walls down. That's not going to be effective. You're missing one powerful tool, and that's praise. And being able to speak to it. Now, notice they were given specific instructions. If we can't follow God's instructions, you know, I hear people talk about, you know what, I hear God, I hear God, I hear God. But do you hear him specific enough to follow him? Well, I heard a noise. Remember that, that part of scripture where it says, some heard thunder, others heard a noise. But God was speaking. And some people heard the words that he spoke. Understand, your hearing has to mature to the point where you actually hear specifics from God so you can follow it. Can you say amen to that? You have to get to the point in your hearing where God says go left and that's the way you go. God says stop complaining and that's the way you go. Because we need to hear him in order to follow him. So they were specifically guided to do sp things that were part of his discipline. And, one, and part of it was, and I love it. I mean, I could stay on Jericho all afternoon because he told him to shut up, <laughs> okay? What do you think that looks like in your life? What does that look like? 
He said, march around the wall seven times, all of you, in order with the worship team close to the front because they're going to shout and the priests in that worship team are going to blow horns and trumpets. They're going to make a racket. But in the process of getting to that point, I want you to zip your mouth and just march quietly. What is God saying with that? What would you say? Yeah, okay, so <laughs> I get that. So number one, one of the messages you could get is focus on what you're doing. What are you here to do? There's a spiritual barrier that you're trying to get through. Zip it and focus on it, amen? What else might that be telling you? God says walk around that wall seven, seven times, and on the seventh time I'm going to tell you what to do, but I need you to be specific, you know, be focused on and clear about what you're going to do before that. You're going to be quiet. What else could that tell you about your life sometimes? Thank you. You need to listen to God for sure. You got to get those specific instructions, and you may have to, through six revolutions, be listening to what God is telling you. What else? Be patient. My goodness. We are like, God, could you take this out of my life right now? Can you take it out of my life? Can't you just take it out of my life? God, it's still in my life. Can't you just take it out? We fret over stuff because our timing and God's timing differs, and we're just like, I just want this over. Instead of saying, zip your mouth. Or praise your God. Can you say amen? See, sometimes we destroy our own lives with our own tongues. How many of you agree with that? Matter of fact, I bet if you listen to yourself, and yes, my, my, my family has challenged me. Do you hear yourself? You're talking to yourself all the time. Do you hear yourself? Matter of fact, you should hear yourself. And maybe a good, ex good ex experiment would be take a, a recorder and just... Keep it around you. Here's the worst place to do it, in your car while you're driving. <laughs> and just listen to yourself. It'll be instructive because you're going to hear what's in your heart. Somebody say amen. You're going to hear it, and you're not always aware of it because we mutter and we do all kinds of stuff. We're always, yeah, you know, something's coming out of our mouth. But sometimes you got to, everybody else is hearing it, so they know where your heart is. You don't. It might be instructive for you to just put a little recorder somewhere and just listen to yourself for a while. And then evaluate what's coming out of your mouth. Evaluate what you're, what, you're, what you're expressing from your heart. And own it because nobody's telling you to say that. You're just doing it. Somebody say amen to that. You can't see because when it's just you, you can't blame it on somebody else. Well, I only said that because Brittany said something to me. That's the only reason I said that, because I had to say it because that's what he said. You know, we always were using each other as examples and excuses for our own conversations. I'll tell you what, get in alone with yourself, get a recorder, listen to yourself, and then own everything that comes out of your mouth. Can you say amen? Own it. That person wasn't there. Susie wasn't there. You were thinking that. And out of the abundance of your heart, your mouth spoke, understand what's going on in your heart. Own it. Own it. No, I said that. Nobody caused me to say it. It might have been the devil, but I had to agree with him in order to say it. Can you say amen? amen. I had to say that thought that the devil put in my head. I'd just like to run them over, praise the Lord. I would. Well, then own it. What makes me want to run somebody over just because they cut me off? What in my heart causes me to be that vengeful? God, am I a vengeful person? Am I angry about other things and I'm willing to hurt someone because they cut me off on a highway? God, what's going on in my heart? Are you hearing me? You see, if, I, if we could get everybody to own their own hearts, we wouldn't have half the strife and trouble that we do. Because we're making excuses. We're saying, well, you said something to me, so i got to say something back to you, and i got to have a bad attitude about what you said to me, and so i got to keep that bad attitude. Matter of fact, I'm going to practice that bad attitude. I'm going to go tell somebody about that bad attitude because she did something bad to me, and i got to tell you about what she did to me because you need to know that she does bad things. And so I'm meditating on how I'm going to tell you that she did bad stuff. And so I'm going to keep talking about how bad that stuff is instead of saying, what in the heck is wrong with me? What's wrong with me? Why can't I forgive her for that? Why can't I get past that? See, that's why this becomes important. Now, remember, what I'm saying is coming out of my heart. Say amen. What I'm, what's coming out of me is coming out of my heart. It's because of what I'm meditating on and how I'm feeling about those meditations. And i got to put that under control. 
I got to put that under control. How many of you agree? It's like, we're like, I want to control. I got to control everybody in my life. No, you got to control the, the tongue in your mouth. That's what you got to control. You got to control what's happening in your heart. And you have to be aware enough of that in order to control it. Until I can get in there and look at it, and God's great to help us. How many of you know, you ask God what's going on in your heart, he will tell you. He will tell you. He'll just like, dude, what are you so keyed up about? What are you so afraid of? Why don't you trust me? I mean, that's the kind of stuff you'll hear. Well, why don't you just trust that my timing is going to be perfect? Why are you afraid of what's going to happen next? Why do you have negative thoughts about your week ahead? What are those things going on? Because I guarantee you, if you can rein that in, you can change your life. Can you say amen to that? If you can rein that in, you can change your life. And the way you change it is how you confess it back out. Somebody say amen. I didn't say your attitude and your feelings instantly change. What I said is you can change them. You can alter them. You have to understand first where you are, and then you got to confess your way out of it. Can you say amen? And praise is one of the ways you do it. If I'm afraid of a God who I think is going to leave me or forsake me, what do I need to put on my tongue? What do I need to do? I got to sow some faith seeds there, don't I? But I got to sow them into my heart. And I have to say, no, my God will never leave me nor forsake me. And I have to confess that. And I have to confess and praise God that he's a God that never leaves nor forsakes. Are you with me? I got to turn that thing around because the words out of your mouth can actually change lots of things. And that was one of the reasons why God uses praise to understand that. Amen? And I love the, you know, in Joshua 6, was it 6, um, 16? And it says, you know what? Shout, for the Lord has given you the city. I mean, that's the punctuation. He's saying, praise me because I'm giving you the victory. You didn't have to work for it. You didn't earn it. I, per I told you what to do. You listened to me. And as a result of listening to me, now you can shout and praise me because I've done the work for you. Can you say amen? How many of you want to stop working so hard and start praising God? You see, he just get, he's he a respecter of persons. Everybody should say absolutely not. Then he, is he going to do for Joshua something he's not willing to do for you? You should say absolutely not. If he's going to do it for him, he'll do it for me. It has the power to bring down walls. The symbolism is good because how many of you have barriers in your life? All of us do. There's, we all have challenges, and they're impossible things. They're like the, you know, the impenetrable city, and I have to, as one person with a stick, try to go break through that wall. The way you break through that wall is God, and your acknowledgement of that is going to be one of the most powerful things, powerful things that happens in your life. Remember I talked about it'll free you from bondage, too. Praise will free you from bondage. Praise will free you from bondage. Praise will actually free you from the internal bondages sometimes that come from depression or self-hatred or anger and things that are in your heart. You have to confess your way out of them many times. Don't expect the doctor to be able to go in there. You know what? They did surgery and I think they messed something up, but in Jesus' name I'm healed. Because even the surgeons have variations. Somebody told me that. He said, what, do you ever, you know, what do you call a doctor that isn't good at surgery? A doctor. That's what he said. I started laughing, but it wasn't funny anymore. What do you call a doctor that's not really good at surgery? A doctor. He's still a doctor, but he may not be good at certain things. Somebody say amen. And so just because he's a doctor doesn't make him perfect. And so just be aware. Doctors don't always fix things. They're practicing Okay, you know who I want to fix me? Come on. You know what I'm going to say. You know, because Jesus doesn't practice anything. Amen. Amen? He is the master teacher, and he's the master surgeon, he's the master thinker, and he's the master art, artist. He's the master musician. Somebody say amen. amen. He is the master musician. Every gift that we have in praise came from him. Somebody say hallelujah. It didn't come from you. You ain't all that. But God is. And so when you see somebody do good music, you know what you should say? Oh, praise God, hallelujah, he gave you that gift. Somebody say amen. And yes, we should acknowledge the gifts that are in people, but not because of them, because they didn't make the gift. God made the gift. And so everything has to make its way back to God. The little puppy makes its way back to God. A bee that I fell in, you know, or a butterfly I fell in love with makes its way back to God. A child that's born makes its way back to God. Makes its way back to God. 
the different kinds of people in this world. My mom and I were talking how different cultures actually have different pieces of truth from God. How many of you knew that? Chinese medicine? That's what we were talking about. We were like, you know what? God is really pretty doggone wise. He didn't just endow into one group of people all of the gifts. He didn't endow into just Christians all of the gifts. He actually spread his grace broadly. Somebody say amen. And now you know what that means. He's actually deposited into every part of his creation some of his beauty. Somebody say hallelujah. He's departed into all of creation some of his beauty. And so every people group, you can love them. You know why? Because there's some of God in them. Somebody say amen. And one of the barriers that we can cut across, these different cultures and, well, they're sort of weird and this group can't drive and, and, and this group loves, you know, just different. I, I was like, you know what? There's a little bit of God in everybody. So don't be all that. Don't be so focused on yourself. You think you got all of God. You don't. As a matter of fact, Scripture tells you that no man can glory in, in what he has because he doesn't have it all. Somebody say hallelujah. And yes, we should explore. We should get closer to different cultures because there's some truth of God in all of them. And what God wants to, what do you think God wants to do with that? If God has sort of spread his gifts abroad through all the man, men on the earth and all the cultures and all the groups, what do you think he's trying to do? Oh, come on, there's only one person that knows that? You know, what is he trying to do? He's trying to bring it all back together. Somebody say amen. And so these schisms that we create or we allow and these, these tendencies we have to be around the people that we like because they look like us, you know you got to get over that in the kingdom of God. You know you're going to have to. See, because when we get in those, in those gold streets of gold, I'm thinking I'm probably going to have some neighbors I might not like in my flesh. But I know I'm going to love every one of them because they're part of God's kingdom. Somebody say amen. So why don't we start here? Why don't we start doing it here? Why don't we start seeing and understanding the beauty of God in the different cultures that we see? I think America is mightily blessed. It's not just because we have many cultures. It's because they're all under the sanction of God. I'll say it again. The possibility is endless because God is willing to pull us all together. And he's no respecter of persons. He doesn't say black is better than white or white is better than black or Indian is better than Chinese. He never says those words. He actually says, I've given gifts to all of them. Can you say amen? And I'm ready to pull them back together. And in Acts 16, at the, and at midnight, Paul and Silas, I love this one because it shows the power of praise right in the center of it. We're like, so how did they get free of that thing? And at midnight, remember, he, we're coming into this and they've both been beat up and they've been given lashes. And they came into a town. They were guided by the Holy Spirit. That's how they got where they got. The Holy Spirit said, I want you to go here. And in going there, they were persecuted. The Holy Spirit knew it, but they were obedient. They listened to God, and they followed the instructions, and they ended up in this place, and what happens? They get persecuted. And our normal reaction as human beings is what? I followed God, and now all heck is breaking loose. I followed God. I did what he said. I ended up in that city, and they've just about thrown me in jail upside down. What do you think the natural tendency is? Please, somebody be honest when you answer me. Huh? No, I ain't following him again. Look what it got me. What else is the natural inclination here? To, <laughs> yeah. It's like, God, can't you see that following you, I got turned upside down and I'm in, I'm in chains? Can't you see that I'm being persecuted for your name? Can't you see that I had trouble? Holy Spirit, why would you send me into the middle of trouble? God, what don't you like about me? Why are you mad at me? What are you doing to me? Why are you persecuting me, God? If we're honest, we know that's the first thing that would be churning around in our head and trying to come out of our mouths. But I will challenge you that that's exactly what should not come out of your mouth. So when you're in a trial, the, the natural thing for you to say should be the last thing that you utter. Let me show you why. And suddenly, and it says, and, and at midnight, Paul and Silas prayed and sang praises unto God. <laughs> Who does that? Who does that? 
They've been beaten and scourged and they were following the Holy Spirit and they ended up in a city where they're now being persecuted and the first thing they thought to do was to pray and to praise their God. Can you say amen? These were men of faith and so they didn't need a good circumstance to praise God. Can you say hallelujah? They didn't need it to all be perfect and everything going right for them to praise God. They didn't need to be, you know, in a place where of honor where everybody's honoring me as this great Christian and they're understanding how awesome I am. And I'm actually in the prison, the lowest of the low, the inner prison, and so I represent, do you know that represented death? When you look closer at this, you realize that being in that inner part of the prison was almost like being in the grave. You weren't far from it. Please, somebody say amen. It was just this waypoint. You're going you're gonna to die here. And so for them to have the presence of heart and spirit to then say, yeah, but you know what? What should we do, Silas? Should we sit here and just complain? No, I think we should pray and praise. I think we ought to shake this place. Can you say amen? They were men of faith, and they knew that, you know what, the only person that's going to save us is going to be God, so why don't we start calling on him right now? Can you say hallelujah? It's, it, why don't we just start calling on him right now? You're in the worst place you've ever been. The first thing you should do, any circumstance, is to pray and to praise God. Can you say amen? Start calling upon the name of the Lord. That's what's going to get you out, not your wild ideas or your strength. None of those things are going to work. And you're just going to wear yourself out. And suddenly there was a great earthquake, so the foundations of the prison were shaken, and immediately all the doors were open, and everyone's bands were loosed. Because I love the Word of God, I see things in this that are off script. Notice how many of the doors were open. Somebody say all. No, notice whose bands were broken everyone do you think there were some guilty people in that prison do you think they were praising God to start do you realize the might of their praise and their prayer set the captives free somebody say hallelujah do you see the size of this and the earthquake was little the earthquake wasn't even the thing when you read the context of the story, you realize, well, okay, so the earthquake shook the prison. That's probably why the doors, the doors became unhinged. You ever seen that? Where because of the shaking back and forth, the door hinges break. And all the doors were open. So that prison itself, as its foundation, was shaken to the point that all the doors opened. There was no limitation to the amount of power that was, was levied on that prison such that it is short of bringing it all down, it was completely set free. And that's not even everything. Not only did that happen, but then all the bands that everybody was bound up in that same prison were all broken. Do you see the magnitude of the power here? This was because they did what two things? They prayed and they praised. I don't know. That blows my mind. See, we don't understand that praise is power. Because if we knew praise was power, you would see us walking around saying, oh, glory to God. I know some people would be like, yeah, but that's Christianese. That's Christians doing their thing. You know what? To a certain extent, I don't care. See, because instead of Christians saying, hey, you know what, glory to God, they're saying glory to all kinds of ugly things. And so I'm going to get to this other principle, and that's where we're going to land today. You know, in order to have praise in your mouth, you've got to take some other stuff out of it. Everybody okay with that? Okay, so now we're heading out into deeper territory. Because I want you available for praise, but in order for you to be available for praise, you've got to unavail yourself of some stuff that's in your life. Everybody okay? Come on, say hallelujah. I see them heads moving, but everybody wants to be quiet about it. <laughs> Out of the mouth shall not flow blessing and cursing. If your mouth's going to be available for praise, you've got to make it unavailable for cursing. I could stop there. I'll still get mail. <laughs> praise God. If I'm going to put something in my mouth, I've got to take something out of my mouth. The work we got to do is to watch what we say. The work we got to do is to not curse but to bless. Somebody say amen. There are two. I can, I can choose. The scripture is very clear. 
about some things about how we confess things. And so I know that I can't praise naturally, so what comes out of me if I put the, the tape recorder in my car and I'm listening to myself later, what I put in is what's going to come out. Everybody okay with that? So I own that. When I hear myself, and if I hear cussing and cursing and anger and strife in my own heart, that's my responsibility. It's not the guy next to me. He doesn't know me from Adam, and it's just a car. He's just doing what he's doing. But I have to then own the fact that, well, I must be putting stuff in there that's now coming back out. Somebody say amen. And if I put in there praise and honor God and glorify God and hallelujah, you know that's what's going to come out. Can anybody say amen to that? If that's what you put in, that's what's going to, you can even say, the guy just cut you off. You're like, oh, hallelujah, praise God, hallelujah, right? Come on, just tell me you never did that. It's better than what you were going to say. Because you can say, well, that was plastic. I just said glory to God because I knew I was going to say, praise God, you're moving in the positive direction. Because what you were going to say was, well, I wish that guy just gets run off the road. Now, maybe, you know what? You just put a curse out there. I don't know. I don't know what's going to come. Because God's giving you the power to bless and curse. Amen. He keeps saying that, but we got to understand what that thing looks like. It really is an act of your faith to confess and to praise. Proverbs 18.20 says, A man's belly shall be satisfied with the fruit of his mouth, and with the increase of his lips shall he be filled. What you're saying is coming back into you. Somebody say amen. I hear that little voice. What you're saying is coming back into you. Matter of fact, you're going to be satisfied or unsatisfied by what you're saying. Somebody say amen. Oh, it's going to hurt. If you're having a, a down day, I, I, I would first say, what are you saying about your day that's making you down? You know, these things that we do, we actually sometimes bring them on ourselves or we don't resist them. We don't, when the devil gives you a thought, well, it's going to be a bad day for you, what did you say? Did you just sit there and say, well, it must have been a bad, it must be a bad day because I have bad days? Or did you say, glory to God, it's going to be a good day? Or good morning. You know, it used to mean good morning. <laughs> when people said good morning, it used to mean it's going to be a good morning. We meant it. And we can start meaning it again because we will be filled out of the out of our own lips. Somebody say amen to that. Because and then it finishes and says, death and life are in the power of the tongue, and they that love it shall eat the fruit thereof. You're gonna, you're gonna, you're gonna live in especially I gotta watch this as a preacher, because the words that I say I know are powerful. I know they are. And so I gotta watch what I say. And I have to become much more conscious of what I'm speaking about. And matter of fact, i got to purify my heart before I get up in front of you. And y'all should have said, hallelujah. Amen. Hallelujah, pastor. Because we don't want you to spew on us. We don't want you to make us angry unnecessarily. We don't want you to talk about other churches. Oh, somebody say amen. That responsibility is on you too. You ain't got no business talking about another church. Somebody say amen. amen. It ain't your business. You don't know what they're called to do. Just take your mouth off them. You don't have any business talking about Christians that ain't walking the way you're walking. You ain't got no business doing that. Amen. Pray for them, help them, but don't talk about them. <laughs> That's not what your business is to do. James 3.8 says, But the tongue can no man tame. It is an unruly evil. Yes, it is. Full of deadly poison. Therewith, bless. see, he's telling you, because the tongue can be so full of evil, I've replaced it with blessing God. You see that? You see the transition? He said, there, therewith bless we God. So in other words, we use the tongue to bless God. Somebody say amen. We use the tongue to bless God. Because the tongue can be so evil, we use the tongue to bless God. We praise God. Even the Father, and therewith curse we men, which are made after the similitude of God. That's just fancy words for saying, you know, we can't curse men because they're made in the image of God. And so it's wrong for us to curse other men. Please say amen. amen. And so that's another thing you've got to take out of your mouth. Because out of the same mouth proceeded blessing and cursing, my brethren, these things ought not so to be. It's not even healthy for you to be a cussing, blessing person. You wonder what God's talking about. It's like being double-minded. Can you see yourself now? When you're double-minded, well, you know, I hate that son of a gun, but oh, praise God. What would you do if you, if you started hearing me talk like that? It's like, you know what, I hate them Catholics, but bless God, I love God. 
But those Catholics, man, they're the worst. But I love, you know, but bless God. Have you heard that coming out of me? You'd say, Pastor, you need some psychological help. Amen. Deliverance, yeah, whatever, right? Heal me, Lord, because out of my mouth is coming blessing and cursing, and that ought not be so. And so in order to avail myself to blessing, I got to cut out some of the cursing. Please, somebody say amen. I got to make myself mindful of what negative things are coming out of my mouth. I know there's a reason for it. I know there are emotions that create it. I get that. And we all struggle with it, but we have to master it. And one of the ways we master it is we exchange what is cursing for what is blessing. And we take the word of God and we hide it in our hearts and it comes out of our mouths and it actually transforms our lives. Can anybody say amen? And that's the power that we have. The last one I'm going to leave you with is this idea that, yes, you can change how you feel. You can change how you feel. I realize there are people with deep depression, and it's, it's much deeper than just saying glory to God. And, and you know, there's, there's deeper situations people can get into, but those are the exceptions. Most of us are not there. So most of us can change our attitude and our feelings by confessing the right things. Everybody with me on that? I know for a fact I can change my day by what I confess. Do you believe you have that power? That you can change your day by what you confess? You can change your circumstance? I can change my attitude toward you by what I confess about you. Somebody say amen. If I know I have a bad attitude toward you, I don't want to talk to her. I got to talk to her again. I can confess, yeah, but she's a child of God made in his image and she is a blessing. And I can look at her life and say, no, she's done good. She's done beautiful things. She has a warm heart. If I confess that, do you think my meeting with her is going to go better? How many of you would say hallelujah? So am I in control or not? You are in control, but I don't feel like it, Pastor. I don't care how you feel. I keep saying that so you get out of that funk that says, because you feel a certain way, like you're a dog or you're an animal, you got to act the way you feel. You don't. God has set you free from that. God sets you free. He gave you a choice. You don't just have emotions. You have control over them. And one of the places, and so don't use that as an excuse. I'm just mad at you. I don't care. You shouldn't be mad at me. You know, that's what my wife says when I say I'm mad at her. She's learned and she's held me accountable to the standard that says, I don't know, if, I don't care if you're having a bad day, you don't treat me that way. Somebody say hallelujah. hallelujah. And she's like, no, that's your problem, not mine. Go get it fixed. And that's her presence of mind to say, no, I don't deserve to spew from you just because you're having a bad day. And you know what? That's a good wife. Somebody say hallelujah. A woman that's going to hold you accountable and say, no, I don't, I don't deserve that. You don't get to do that. You should be in command of yourself, big man of mine. And you should be able to control how you respond to your emotions if you can't control those emotions. Eventually, your confession will shift how you feel. Please, somebody say amen. And you will take command over them. Stand with me this morning.